Okay, we are live, sir. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? So nice to see you. Yes, likewise. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, we haven't met in a long time, so this is now virtual meeting as if, as all of us are doing, and I'm very happy to be here to participate in this um, chat on your channel. I've I've always loved talking to you, sir, and it's always words of wisdom and uh, so much to learn from. Now it's been about 40 years, right, since you've been in the industry playing professionally? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been about little, maybe a little bit more than that, actually. Uh, maybe, yeah, but 40 is a good number. Wow. <laughs> so there's one thing about your career, which is there's this position you hold in a band, which is very special. So you have your trios, you have Secret, you have Merkaba. And everywhere you're, you're kind of leading the band in a manner that you have a lot to say, you have a lot to share. When I'm listening to your solo, you take me on a whole journey. There's a whole story involved completely. So we hear a lot from people, your solos should sound like a story and uh, they should have a meaning, they should have questions, they should have answers. But then there is this doubt that I personally went through and I still go through is why would somebody listen to my solo? Why would somebody listen to me play for whatever, five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, and you pull off solos which are as long as an hour if we talk about the whole gig. Did you ever have those self-doubts? Because it's not nothing to do, got nothing to do with skill for sure. Practicing at home, soloing at home is a different story. But then this self-doubt hits when you're on stage, when you're trying to play a solo and there's this question mark that I am playing, but is anybody listening? Would anybody listen? Wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, those challenges, um, yeah, I certainly went through them. And maybe sometimes when I'm not focused, uh, it still happens. You know, you just maybe get taken by the moment. Um, uh, and kind of, uh, you know, your mind starts thinking too much. You know, uh, you can't play with your mind, right? I mean, in the sense that an ideal way to play music would be through intuition. Mm. Um, the part, using the part of your brain, which is uh, the intuitive part of your brain, as opposed to the thinking part of your brain. Right. So obviously the attempt uh, each time uh, you play music is um, at least when you're performing it or uh, in performance mode uh, is to be able to tap into that part of your head. So really there's two, two sides of your brain and I, I kind of talk about this quite a lot. Um, when you're working on something specific, learning a new scale or a, something new, you are actually using that that logical part of your head, hmm. you know, working out your fingering or, or some such thing, um, learning a melody, learning the notes of the melody or learning the rhythmic value. But then there's this other part of your head, which is the intuitive part of your brain, which is uh, really the ideal way to actually be playing music, to be not thinking. Obviously, that can that happens once you've internalized certain concepts, but um, I mean, it becomes easier. Hmm. It becomes easier to uh, to expand your vocabulary once you've internalized certain concepts. But the fact is that you can use that, anybody can use that part of the brain because all of us have it. So the attempt always is to be able to tap into that part. Um, I mean, as far as solos and telling a story or being lyrical with your solos and things like that. I think there's quite a few things that go into that. Mm -hmm. um, I think being able to sing, not that I'm a singer, but the, the ability to sing out things, learn things away from your instrument and being able to sing a melody accurately and well is a, is a great place to kind of start. You know, uh, of course, there are other things, other techniques of storytelling in music. 
I don't want to delve into that too deeply because it'll one hour will go just in talking about that. But but I think the ability to sing because all of us want our instrument to sing, you know, right. have that singing ability. Well, it's not going to really come from the instrument unless you actually are able to to hear that or sing that. So. Uh, the ability to sing a melody and practice things away from your instrument is a great place to start you know working on 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 that so when when you internalize these concepts let's say of uh, making um, you have enough skill but what i'm precisely asking and curious about is that there is this whole you know attack of self doubt when you step into that mode yeah and so those how are how do you encounter that how do you challenge that right so those those really are are actually you know self work that's a personal thing uh, it's less to do with that's, music that, that's that's i think self work i mean i think uh, you know dealing with one's insecurities and things like that um is something that uh, has to do with one's uh, you know character and and uh, those are things that you have to kind of be conscious about and uh, you know work on uh, for me i meditate regularly mm-hmm. and um, it's been a huge uh, contribution to um, my well-being and that kind of translates into music it allows me to focus more when i play it. and uh, people are always going to judge you but you know you don't you don't have to necessarily be you know react to it right you know um you know whether you're you're a musician or otherwise i mean you know especially though if you're an artist and when you put out work you're being judged all the time or when you're on stage you know everybody's judging especially if it's a room full of musicians mm. most judgmental people are the musicians mm. analyzing everything you play and you know there's uh, and and these things come from you know some kind of insecurity you know i, I mean it should you know we should be encouraging each other mm. um and have kind of like a brotherhood and camaraderie but because of insecurity often times you, you know one doesn't come across those things and then there's you know the other thing you have to also accept is that everybody is on a on us on a path and you have to respect that um there is sometimes things take time to develop right yeah and you have to be patient with yourself yeah um and there's no doubt that um a couple of things one is obviously the obvious one is that you need to work on your music um but uh, along with that it's really important that you're working it the right way and i think some guidance if needed is a great idea you know um to find a good teacher who can guide you and just put you in the right direction so you know the right things to focus on um you need to hang with good musicians musicians who inspire you um and who you can play who you who you can learn from right um I'm learning all the time uh, you know teaching has been a good thing for me because I've I've been able to dig deeper into whatever all the basic things that I know That's right and I, sometimes I'm you know students ask me questions which make me think in a different way and so I'm I'm constantly kind of learning so you need to have that open attitude of being able to learn being able to absorb so and know that you know that each one of us are in are an individual and we each one have a voice right and we need to kind of dig deep to kind of uh find it and and uh, and develop it and keep getting better at it right so that's a that's a journey you have to kind of um uh be sure to kind of you know and be determined and and you need to be dedicated i mean it's a it's a serious thing being an artist for me from the time that i became a musician there was and pretty much now i'm i i really try to keep it simple 
Number one, I play music because I love to play music. Mm -hmm. That's the main reason I play music. It's kind of maybe it's selfish, but <laughs> I, I find I find enough joy just playing music by my in my room. The fact that I can share it with others, of course, is a bonus. Um, and the other one, other thing that's been with, a constant with me since I became a musician is that how can I how can I become a better musician? Right. It's always been the fo focal point uh, in my uh, in my journey as a musician. Is you know what is it? Can, what what can I do to become a better yeah. musician? You know, constantly learning new things, working on so, certain things. You know, there's a there's a bunch. There's so just a things. second, I want to you know connect this with this whole. Uh, you're talking about growing as a musician, as a as a, improving everything in musicality. But I also know for a fact that you're always also working on yourself as an individual. Like you're trying to develop yourself right. so that it can complement the musicality that you're lifting. Because, you know, mentioning that self-doubt right. aspect again, it sometimes happens that the room might not judge you so much as you're judging yourself. You end up in this war in your mind trying to wonder right. what's going on. But then um, how much... Um, of course, there's time you put into practice. There's time you uh, give to music, studying with somebody. And then there is this individual journey, the personal journey of an individual to feel comfortable enough to be out there, to be vulnerable, to be ready to face humiliation sometimes when things don't go right. So how do you develop that aspect of yourself where you're growing as an individual strong enough to, to take these huge steps that you take as an individual, that be out there, play two hours of guitars and just be in a trio situation. Yeah, a lot of the times, you know, this humiliation that we talk about so much, um, it's all pretty much in your head, right? Right. It's your, it's your head playing, playing, playing with you all the time. That's right. Um, so, you know, I, I have to quote um, Herbie Hancock, who said that uh, I am a human being first and a music is what I do. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much, you know, it kind of changed when I heard that it kind of really made a huge impact on me. And that's true. A lot of us get carried away with, uh, you know, what we do. I'm a doctor, I'm a musician, mm -hmm. I'm this and that, I'm a CEO. No, man, you're just a human being like you and me, you know, we're all the yeah. same. <laughs> So uh, if you get carried out, carried out, uh, you know, get carried away with 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 whatever position that you're, you know, up or you know whatever. These are just your mind, you know, just playing games with you. So yeah, um, obviously um, working on yourself has been um, something that I, um, I kind of also have been on it uh, since. I guess since I um, branched out, I left living with my parents when I was about 25. And actually, I, I moved to America at that time. But it, it was a huge part of the journey, uh, not just uh, the fact that I studied music and all of that happened, but uh, a huge part of it was just the ability to be responsible and look after myself and, and learn about life uh, by myself. And that's would really you, where, go ahead. Uh, I was asking, would you say that one should put themselves voluntarily into positions like you just mentioned, that you're by yourself, you're responsible for your own actions? Because if you have, uh, let's say, parents backing you all the time, then your life actions, the steps you take are very different from uh, what you would otherwise do as an individual when everything that you do you are responsible for it if you have food tomorrow on your table or not you are responsible for it yeah um, I, I, I would encourage that in people um, I, I think I was lucky and unfortunate that uh, even though it was very reluctant my parents had no idea what I was venturing into I went away to a foreign land and uh, trying to and it was um, quite a journey, and and um, it was tough, difficult for them to to see me go through uh, uh, being poor. 
<laughs> and and struggling um it didn't matter to me but uh, for them it was a big deal but coming back to yeah i think it's a necessary step that each one should take because you have to be able to look at the world with your own sensibility and with your own eyes not with the way we've been colored uh, i mean all respect to the, our parents because they do love us very much and they wish us well but uh, that doesn't mean they always know what's good for you mhm that's right but people not me not like yeah. what i'm saying but that's my my opinion and um they always will come around you know um so however I, you know i think different people's situations are different so it may not always be easy for someone to make uh, to do that right for example my situation now is is different i i live with my mom i i need to look after my mom and that has um posed some amount of uh um uh, not restrictions but uh you know challenges uh you know because uh, uh i have to just make sure that i'm i'm around to look after her so mm-hmm. in those kind of situations obviously that kind of takes priority you know right. you you can't be selfish and you need to be a good human being and do what's right in every stage of your life man so uh, you know i was lucky and fortunate that when i was young that i had some kind of uh, intuition and calling and i decided that uh, I mean I was already playing music but you know as I said uh, I wanted to become a better musician I wanted to learn study and I got a chance to exit right. and uh, and be in an environment that was uh, encouraging um stimulating and most importantly I was living by myself on my own terms um being yeah, I, responsible I think that ex- that responsibility aspect sorry to cut you is is a huge contributor to uh, i mean all the musicians i have uh, i look up to you or the other you know amazing richard bona or somebody like that life path has been very interesting and uh, whoever has soaked themselves into hardships either voluntarily or life was like that and when they came out of it the essence of that experience is so strong in the life or musicianship of the human being it's amazing like you can't uh, practice that it's uh, yeah it's you know how your life is intertwined your musicianship is intertwined by the experiences with the experiences that you have had in the past so that Certainly. whole responsibility i think is is a huge contributor to one's musicianship yeah you got to <laughs> I mean you know you talked about telling a story. Mm. I mean yeah, uh you know I can talk about this at length and talk, talk about the techniques of storytelling in music and all of those you know we can we can break it down in theory and all of that. But the truth is you need to have some story to tell. Mm. You know, um whether it's from this life or some past I, I don't know but <laughs> and there there needs to be there needs to be some story to be told and um when you live life honestly uh, certainly you do have um the op- because that's when you really have the opportunity to dig down deep and know yourself better and um then of course it's the ability to actually tap in to that and be able to express that you know that's work also um but being able to put yourself out there is an opportunity to essentially develop yourself and have something to say right. you know i think it's really really, really important um and i mean i don't even i'm i'm not a lyric writer but i think even in 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 lyric lyric writing and things like that um you know you need to have some story to to have you need to have lived a little bit and um the thing is that at, at least for average middle class people in india um i'm making very general statements please forgive me but uh, you know um when you live in a house where everything is looked after uh, you don't really have a chance to really develop that part of your your being 
So um, then there'll be, you know, you would not have been able to look at life fully, you know. Um, but when you're out by yourself, looking after yourself and things like that, hundred uh, percent, you know, you certainly, you certainly, life will throw all these curveballs at you, uh, you know, uh, which you need to be ready for, and and uh, you need to deal with it. And uh, it'll make you a stronger person and a better person um, if you're able to process that information in the right way, you know. So that self-worth thing is a constant thing for 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 us all, you know, every day. Right. You know. I mean, from my experience also, when I moved to Bombay and the way uh, I can easily say life hit me, like you have to, you're by yourself now. You have to resolve and you have to be responsible for everything you do. I never looked at finances the way I started looking at uh, finances the way when I came to Bombay. Delhi, I was living with my parents, so all I had to do was earn money and there was no system to it. Sometimes there was right. money, sometimes there was no money and if there was no money, there was still food. There was no rent to be. Yeah. When I came here, when I gathered more life experiences, when life started showing me more things and then of course i had other things going on in my life it was definitely a huge shift in my musicianship which was not related to practice for some reason it just uh made me rethink or not not even rethink right it's it's just that intuition part got activated which you just talked about that there was something else to share something else to converse not just in music but in general also in life wanted to share want to talk if somebody had an issue i could talk to them because there's some extra experiences of uh, layers of experience that are added to my life which i can't even begin to imagine uh, when <laughs> when i grow older how life is going to kind of compound and stack up and teach so much to the individual it's, it's yeah it doesn't it doesn't really um yeah, it, it kind of goes on and on and on. And there are phases where the, the activity is really intense. And, and, you know, I used to, I used to kind of, um, I had to come to terms with it because there were times in my life where things, you know, there were not that many responsibilities. I mean, recently, right. and I dedicate a lot of time to music and, you know, things that I love to do. And then uh, life changed, you know, a um, lot of things started to develop that was take, that were taking me away from the things that I would rather spend time on, and it really uh, disturbed me. I was I was not happy, you know. I was like, man, I'd rather just wake up and play music, man. Why is why do I have to do all this other stuff, you know? Hmm. And I'm talking. This is just recently in the last few years, you know. The amount of time that I've dedicated being able to dedicate to music has is not the same as, as it was 10 years back mm. and and then i i realized that man it's when you when all this stuff is going on in your life that means you're living mm. i mean that yeah you know um I, I can hear a singer in the background yeah vasu is teaching she's giving a lesson outside over skype so and that... so so it's a sign that you are living you know, and uh, the, with the more intensity that you live in, you live with, the more your life is going to be be busy. And so, so then it just becomes a question of, man, how am I going to manage all of this stuff? Mm. How am I? Because this thing is not going to change and it is my life and these are my responsibilities, whatever it is. Right. Uh, whether it be looking after a family member or looking after the house or any other responsibilities that you have that take you away from perhaps music. Mm -hmm. And um, so then it becomes about time management. Right. And you need to be like, incredibly disciplined. And mm -hmm. um, you need to find the time and place and have some... Like for me, you know, I, I'm a routine kind of guy. Yeah. I have set times in the in in the day where I prefer to play music. I have set times in the day where I do my meditation and mm. whatever, all, all the other things. So, and though that routine becomes like incredibly important because if you 
are unable to do that, then you're not going to be able to actually churn out, um, you know, new compositions or um, work on your playing. And, you know, because there's so many disciplines in, in music as well. So anyway, you need to be extremely dedicated and you need to be able to manage your time and don't sleep too much. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you sleep in general? How many hours? I, I think it an, ends up being about six or seven, six. Mm. I mean, still, you know, it's still, when you wake up, you want to kind of lie down in bed a little bit more. But, yeah, but bed yeah, always I mean, calls all you. The, there's all these things to be done and... Um, you have to you have to be on it otherwise it's not going to happen right you know? so you have to make a decision for yourself you know this is a very personal thing mm -hmm. um, uh, you want to become a better better player you know you need to you need to work on your playing you need to get guidance if necessary um, you need to be practicing in a very dedicated way you want to write music, compose music, well, you need to spend time on it, right. you know. It, it's, like, it's like a job. You need to wake up in the morning and, and or whatever your time is and and sit and, you know, just force yourself almost to do that, you know. Um, Have you read this book called Turning one, Pro by Stephen Pressfield by any chance? No, I haven't actually. So he talks about these struggles that artists generally face, which is, for example, not I don't feel like playing today, I don't feel like practicing today. So, so he says that the difference between a professional and an amateur is very simple. So a professional writer, for example, will sit and write when it's time to write. It does not depend how you're feeling. It does not depend what's going on. If it's raining, it's not raining. But the, the professional shows up every day to do right. the work that is needed to grow. That's the only that, difference that. between a professional and an amateur. And he takes it to a level where there's a person, he mentions two authors, I, I'm not able to recall names. But there's an, there's an author who, who writes when he feels like. And he comes out with one novel every seven or eight years. And then there's another author who is a pro. Now they're both professionals. It's not, it doesn't mean they're not proficient. But he said that you become yeah. a professional when you do what you do when it's time to do it. So you show up, you yeah. do the work, and you carry on. So you actually always suggested, sir, that um, when I was taking, whenever I would come take lessons with you, rather, is that um, there was this thing that you would say that no matter what, write a little something every day make a little piece of music mm. and you kind of develop that aspect of yourself so you look at writing practice as a separate thing altogether rather than yeah. uh, thinking of it just as something that is going to happen as a consequence of practicing guitar or bass or drums whatever so you see yeah, it's, it's it has a separate skill set right well, yeah for it certainly is a separate skill set. Not not every musician um, is necessarily uh, a composer. Mm. It's it, it's two different skill um, skill sets, and um, uh, two different disciplines. Mm. But for me, it's just merged. You know, uh, in the sense that um, so com. Composing and being able to come up with something, uh, luckily for me, started at a very, pretty much almost at the very, very start of my musical. So when I was about 16, 17 is when I started playing guitar. And, and um, the, the quest to be able to create something was, I was hungry for it right from the start. So you know as i said it merges so the study the study of new information and the ability to maybe create something has merged for me always because you know you're working on a concept in the beginning it was something as simple as a new chord mm. you know 
the first time I heard a major seventh chord, I, I, it was like, you know, uh, something new for me. And uh, I liked the sound or perhaps uh, maybe like a, a major nine or something, you know, when there's a new, using open strings of the guitar, perhaps, you know, maybe I, I, I was inspired by Shakti or something like that. And, you know, uh, the sound of a chord was sometimes enough to inspire me to maybe do something with it, find mm -hmm. a few other chords that go along with it and maybe write a melody. And it's really the same now, you know, I'm working on, on, on new concepts. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm working on a particular scale or, or some kind of scale pattern. So and, the song and, Ro Rohan Oscar you wrote was specifically, yeah. it came from practicing a scale, right? He was saying that you wanted to do something with the diminished yeah. scale. And instead yeah, of sitting and practicing permutations, you decided to write a song and then gig with the song so that you can really know the insides of a diminished composition. Well, it, it just it was, it's a, it was a consequence. It was a consequence of study, the study of that particular skill. Um, you know, as um, I'm going to just get little little technical, not too much, but I mean, uh, when you study um, a scale the first thing you do is just learn the notes of the scale. Mm. But that's only the beginning of the study, right? Then you kind of get deeper into it by maybe doing some sargams, if I may use a terminology of Hindustani music. Absolutely. Scale, scale patterns, right? Thirds, fourths, whatever, you know, all those kind of things. That's really when the nature of the scale, or maybe you find out, hey, what are the chords that go along with the scale or whatever, right? That's like the deeper kind of study of the scale, right? So then you come up with certain 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 things and that that inspire you, you know, um, to um, to basically develop, you know, something something that you may hear that that gets your ear. That's pretty much the process of songwriting and, and composing something, you know, you have a little spark always. It always starts with a little spark. Now, that spark could be anything. It could be one chord. It could be a particular passage of a scale. It could be some scale pattern. It could, could be a title. It could be whatever, a little. And then, as you said, it's just the ability to expand on that, to make mm. it big and bigger until it becomes so that that is when you need to show up right so because um out of all the songs that i've written um maybe you know there have been one or two occasions in the last 40 years where something is just poured out you right. know it can it can happen um but all the rest, 98% of it is just showing up and, and developing, you know, and sometimes ideas take time to develop a few days, a few weeks, a few yeah. months, a few years. Mm. It's happened, you know, where there are ideas and some that I still have not developed, mm. you know, that I had still folders in my computer. So um, it's always about expanding uh, that little thing yeah so coming back to your question yeah for me it's kind of the study of things and uh, expanding and writing and composing is kind of merged but there are times now in my life because now it's kind of gone to the next level where because we're releasing music I need to write for a band I need to make charts there's a lot of discipline that goes into it not just that there's technology now as well because all the ideas are sketched on a computer so i have to kind of so there's the writing and composing part i usually write on 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 guitar or away from the guitar as in i don't usually sit on the computer until i've pretty much sketched most of the idea in my head away from the computer but then i sketch it on the computer hmm. so um yeah you need to you need to show up you need to you need to be on it uh, and be dedicated and finish it um, and do whatever is necessary in order for you to have completed the idea if you need to share it with a band you know you need to maybe if you need to make charts you need to do that 
you need to send everybody an mp3 file you need to you need to be you need to be on it and that's part that's part and parcel of being uh, that's you know that's the job right you know? right or i don't want to even use the word job because it makes it sound corporate but um, but i mean the thing is that a, the consistent growth in a corporate culture of any company but i mean this is this is true you know uh, it's it's a basic kind of uh, it's it's way of functioning it, it, i i feel that sometimes musicians prioritized how they are feeling over everything so much that they that the work suffers that that mm-hmm. work they were supposed to put in suffers if you don't feel like going to your job tomorrow it doesn't work you still go you will still do your mondays tuesday wednesday unless you have the luxury to take that off and i just sometimes wonder that if if one applies that to their musicianship uh, what what can happen i was just talking to uh, wasu 2 3 days ago like i've been cooking every day for now we are in the 5th month right of the lockdown so 5 months 3 hours every day i spend in the kitchen and i can cook now like i can really cook i can bake and all this has happened just because uh-huh. this is what i have been doing every day 3 hours i mean i yeah. could cook earlier but it wasn't the same but then i was thinking man how about i i bring a similar schedule to bass playing i do one hour in the morning one hour in the afternoon and one hour in the evening it doesn't that's matter because in the yeah in time. the kitchen work it doesn't matter if how i'm feeling we we have to cook we have to cook so that we can eat but somehow as a musician we end up in this place where ah i don't feel like let's do this tomorrow it's too much work something or the other keeps popping up so what do talk to you about gear like uh i remember it was jazz day we were at blue frog and uh, one of the faculties from true school of music was playing guitar and you got very excited and uh, you ran towards the stage you were like i want to see his gear and you go towards the stage and you just see one cable and you come back to the green room and you were like i knew it it's just the cable it's the <laughs> best pedal ever nothing in the middle just the guitar straight into the fender it works what are your thoughts on that do we need good great gear or one needs to really shed on the guitar itself bass itself and make sure it sounds the best it can by itself yeah i think i think the starting point is the ability to to be able to generate a sound from your instrument because the sound that's generated comes from mainly your your hands and your ears mm. uh so that that is that should always be the starting point um you can't generate any tone unless you're hearing that tone in your in your head mm-hmm. you can't pick up someone else's gear and has use his settings and expect to sound the same it just doesn't happen mm. uh so the first the first uh part is definitely the ability to get a good sound on your instrument um just um by itself you know uh for me i mean so then the question is you know what is a good sound uh, so for me as a guitar player and what i talk to about to my students is the ability to have a a round fat something round and warm and big big sounding tone you know and that comes from from your hands you know how you attack the instrument um your left hand your right hand it's very subtle and these are things that take time to develop you know um so i think that should be the starting point you know the ability to just get a good nice clean tone mm. you know without any gimmicks uh having said that <clears throat> pedals are part and parcel of of our life as a musician as in sounds that are just not clean you know for me to unless i'm playing a, a gig that's purely like a straight ahead jazz gig where i just want a clean tone um will i then i want just a clean tone but all mainly all other styles of music at least contemporary western music i want sounds 
my electric guitar needs to have sound with an edge. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so then pedals and maybe some amount of processing, delay, reverb. Um, I think uh, it's definitely uh, something that enhances your sound. However, I would say, you know, 85 to 90 percent is your hands. Five percent is the amp. Mm -hmm. and, or maybe 10 percent is the amp. Mm -hmm. So 85 plus 10 is 95. And then the balance five percent is the pedals. Right. That's the that's the ratio that I would I would kind of say. And also using pedals is not an easy thing. I mean, you need to spend a lot of time on the pedals to understand how to generate the sound that you want. So, yeah, referring to other people and getting inspiration from other people is a good place to start. Hmm. Um, and then you need to take that information and be able to process it and then do something with it and take it to the next level and make it your own and make it personal. Right. Because so, all our musicians usually um, have an identity with their sound and it's easy to recognize hey you know that's so and so musician or that's that's Santana I mean a couple of notes and you just know it's Carlos Santana you know? <laughs> so Sava was telling the story Sava uh, is uh, we played with Sava right in Delhi oh, yeah. great great drama great jazz drama has tons of stories to tell so he was mentioning once one of his friends uh, either in Florida or Bulgaria I'm not able to remember but he was mm -hmm. uh, he was really crazy about pedals. All he dreamt was how can, uh, you know, he can get the, uh, the, the John Schofield sound from, from his gear. So he had all these pedals that he'll keep changing time and again. And he'll always keep telling his friends, I don't have the right pedals to get that tone and it's not working and all that. And it so happened that one day, one of their club gigs, John Schofield showed up. He was there. <laughs> and uh, whatever he he had his set of pedals with him and uh, John Schofield said that uh, I would like to jam or whatever they invited him to the stage so a couple of tweaks to the same uh, set of pedals he held the guitar and everything changed it was just that the whole thing in the guy's head that it's coming from the pedals but I think it's a lot to do with your ears as you're saying yeah if you it's can't from, from the ears from the hands and then the whole balance aspect of it so I, you i have a similar sorry. story about another artist pat Matheny. you know he was a gear nerd you know he never used to go and play any gigs hmm. without all this gear and he happened to be in a jam session somewhere in europe and obviously he didn't have all his gear hmm. and he played through not even his guitar not not even the amp nothing you know, he was using somebody else's gear and somebody made a tape of it and he heard it back and he realized he sounded just like him. <laughs> and all his uh, idea of, you know, gear, everything changed. So mm. it really is in your hands and your ears. Uh, if you can't hear it, it's very difficult to generate it, that tone. You emphasize a lot on studying the blues. When I was studying with you, the first thing you told me that spend time just playing the blues. Now what happens yeah. is it's a little different for the bass player. Why I'm saying that is that the kind of things you you hear being played off a guitar, unless yeah. you're trying to transcribe the guitar solos, let's say, on the bass. But how can a bass player make the most of studying blues? Because when I'm saying studying in the sense that as a guitar player, you hear Stevie Ray Vaughan doing all that stuff, hitting those chords, playing all those phrases and everything. Now the immediate uh, benefit that a bass player can get out of this is you learn those licks, you start yep. doing those phrases on the bass as a soloist. Apart from that, what is it that a bass player can really get from studying blues deeply? Yeah, well, I emphasize the blues a lot because it's really, it's the foundation of contemporary Western music, uh, right from before the Beatles, and then all the pop music that came out of that 
all was inspired by the blues you know a lot of it was inspired by the blues the foundation of rock rock and roll i mean it's all it's all the blues the foundation of jazz you know is the blues um and there's a certain soul element to the blues as in in terms of emotional emotion, emotion yeah. Emo- and uh, quite frankly um it's unique uh, in that there's not much else in western music that allows you that soul factor the way the blues does so having said this and then of course it's my personal uh preference as well i grew up listening to music that was blues inspired so that also has to do with it but as i've grown as a musician i find it's like a vital element in the growth as a musician and i'm not the only one who feels this way i've spoken to senior great musicians and they have expressed similar sentiments um so i feel uh, coming to your question which is uh, you know how can a bass player uh, what they can learn? so first of all you know i have to say that i consider myself not a guitar i mean guitar is my primary instrument but i consider myself a musician first mm-hmm. right so so for me being a musician is everything about music you know what is the drummer playing what is the bass player playing what, what is the guitar playing what voicing is the keyboard playing what's the melody everything it's music for me you know yeah as a guitar player i've studied certain things and it's my primary instrument how i express myself but i've always been fascinated by music as a whole so first of all i mean so the as a bass player so i would look even as a bass player to be a musician to be a well-rounded musician right. what is that not just to be a bass player to know what else is happening you know what's the harmony you know what are those chords uh what's the melody playing on top of that you know what kind of groove am i playing you know and what is that melody that's making me feel this way yeah. why is it making me feel this way right so there are all these aspects right so a bass player has two functions the main function obviously is your part of the rhythm section right that's the number one responsibility of a bass player so obviously you need to study those grooves you know uh if it's a shuffle boom to 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 boom 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 what you know each different different grooves have different um kind of uh rhythmic motifs and notes that the bass player plays so that's one part of it right the other part of it is man maybe i want to write a blues melody okay well then you know you need to figure out what is it you know because it's not just the pentatonic scale everybody knows the pentatonic scale but why does if you want to talk about the blues you need to figure out okay why is the, is the pentatonic scale sounding the way it does so there's a language to the blues and you need to learn that language unless you learn the language you're not really going to understand right uh, or be express that so you need to if you're serious about music you need to develop all these aspects of it you know and again singing you know melody is always on top you know you need to figure out learn some blues melodies not to be singers but just to see what those notes do against the chords and why why is it sounding the way it does you know um there's a science to it you can understand the science to it and then you need to be able to if it if it attracts you you need to uh kind of study it learn some examples um but to answer your question yeah i mean uh, blues is an is an essential factor that um i am attached to <laughs> right no i mean when i did that lesson with you first thing i came home i learned i spent a good month or something just learning a long freddy king solo mm. and it literally had a huge effect on the way uh, i would phrase very specifically yeah. you learned you learned some of the the language of it yeah and everything changed then uh, you know how i had heard all the time that 
if you don't know what you're exactly going to go towards just go towards the blues mm. you will find changes if there are a lot of changes or whatever is going on so it's it's kind of a methodology that a lot of people resolve even um, you know when i hear you play like the tons of changes going on and there's this blues vocabulary popping in popping out all the time and it's got this relief factor to it yes it's, it does it just brings everything going on it brings everything back home it's just, really, it definitely so, uh, stitches everything together i mean that's what i i mean to say yeah it it certainly does and uh, there's a certain soul thing to it man i mean you know uh, that i encourage um people who are interested in western music to really kind of study uh, and and get into the blues and it's simple music you know it's <laughs> a certain simplicity to it it's not it's not really complicated um but there's a vibe and there's a soul um i mean for example there are jazz standards and heads which are pretty kind of technical you know or i'm right now i'm i'm studying uh, a classical piece called shoro number no. 1 in fact i was practicing it when we were doing the sound check yes it's demanding you know it's very demanding the blues is not it's technically it's not that demanding but that's not what it's about it's it's about that soul factor and the emotional content behind the music you know and but you need to learn the language you right. just need to learn which and you need to listen to the great masters and it's essential because it's really where the music has come from what all so, listening do you suggest in terms of blues well the three kings yeah bb king uh freddy king albert king mm -hmm. muddy waters mm -hmm. um these are the legends you know uh, it's a great great place to start and um then couple of younger cats robin ford stevie ray vaughan you know the thing is the greatest jazz i'm uh, sorry uh, greatest blues musicians or at least 90 95% of them are all guitar players right and mainly singer singer guitar players um so uh it's essential that you listen to them you know uh, the guitar just lent itself very easily uh because of the ability to bend the notes and as a perfect uh, uh instrument to to accompany uh the singing right so i think these names are are a great place to start mm. there are lots of other great blues musicians but these ones is a great place to start you know so you you played a lot of sitar right uh in the earlier years like when you were in school or something yeah. spent about 4 or 5 Please. years yeah i did um uh, from age 11 to 15 i did i played uh, sitar um and when you were class. making the switch from uh, those inflections that kind of a language to the western culture when you're trying to learn these standards blues and all that was it that your playing was still showing those phrases and how you know indian classical moves a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of linear patterns in indian classical music because the rag is set if you switch too much into intervals the rag changes altogether so did you see that uh, and how hard was it to get out of that whole thing yeah so first of all i must say that you know um i did grow up like a lot of us in um metro cities in india um quite westernized so i was speaking in english and i was although i was listening the main most amount of the music that i was listening to was mainly western music i was not listening that much avidly to classical hindustani music in fact i listen to it more now than than at that time mm. um also i must point out that when i first started playing guitar i couldn't play any lines it was only playing a few chords and and singing simple songs mm. you know it allowed you to do that because you could learn two three chords and play a song and sing a song as long as it's that not was... a bar chord everything is fine right right and then the bar chords also came slowly slowly uh, you know um but i remember how tough they were uh, in the beginning uh, <laughs> so um no uh, none of none of that really 
uh, seeped into my. Uh, but good question, mm. good question, because I see this all the time in um, people who are fully trained in Hindustani or Carnatic music and m try to make the switch to um, you know Western music, mm. and, and kind of it's it takes some time because the sensibility is different. But my sensibility was not. I was already singing in English, mm. and I was already hearing those simple rock and roll songs, and so and I was only playing chords, you know. So, uh, in fact, once the guitar came into my hand, uh, I'm, I'm. It's sad to say, but um, you know, this I never went back to the sitar. <laughs> it was just the obvious choice, and um, you know, I love the sitar as an instrument, and uh, but. Uh, I, the guitar just became yeah. the obsession that so, kind of never went. The rigorous ear training that happens when you study Indian classical music, even if you're playing an instrument, you're still, there is always this priority that, hey, be able to sing the notes of the rag, be able to sing those yeah. phrases and then play it on your instrument. So that rigorous ear training that uh, Indian classical music kind of gets you into, did it help you learn Western music faster when you were trying to understand intervals, melodies, harmony? Yeah, I mean, I already, I, I always had, I had some sense of ear. I mean, you know, uh, you know, pitch. I mean, I could, I if I heard a melody, more than likely, I'm talking simple melodies. I could probably, uh, you know, emulate it. I could sing it. Hmm. Um, and yeah, certainly, I think that study of the Hindustani also uh, was part of that that process that really, really kind of inspired and, and kind of helped me um, with it. But as I realized, as I went on, uh, it was, yeah, I had a relative sense of high and low, you know, so I could, you know, maybe sit on a, on a harmonium or a keyboard and if I had if I could sing a melody, I could more than likely play it. Mm. But, you know, when it came then to chords and things like that, I realized my my ears were not trained at all. And then in jazz, it the was, saw changes, then we are like, what just happened? Well, that, that's, that's uh, yeah, that, so there are different, there are different stages to developing your ear that happen over a period of time as you get exposed to more music and as you study more music. Um, uh, you kind of develop your ear more, but it's a very important aspect of the growth as a musician because it's really difficult to play or write or compose things that you don't hear in your head. Do you think right now uh, or in general, there's less emphasis given to solfege training in Western music when it comes to learning an instrument or anything else? Not if you go to a good teacher who knows what he's talking about. Mm. Uh, I think um, if you go to someone who is a good teacher, they will make sure that you do sing. Right. For me, it's you know everyone who who comes here to learn uh, are required to sing. Right. Every 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 song that's learned is first sung before it's even played on the guitar. There's no, uh, there's no escaping that. It becomes easy also. I was listening to Richard Bona's interview a while back and he was mentioning that, I think he was asked that, what would you suggest, like if somebody has to become a better musician? And he was mentioning how he doesn't play his instrument so much, but he said that if I'm able to sing it, then I can map it on my instrument. And then I yeah. can figure it all out that what am I, am I going to do with this song or what is the bass line like? He said that his the whole thing is always revolving around singing. And I think there also right. comes a point when you start seeing the fretboard. You start seeing it without having it in front of your eyes and it just starts building from there. The most, uh, you know, fantastic thing that I learned when I did my lessons with you was like how you... I was asking you how to solo and you said that you stop thinking about notes. First thing you do is you think about rhythms and start mm -hmm. walking to rhythms, start building your rhythms around songs. 
what right. what i had faced and i had learned from whatever my resources were earlier was that if i would ask anybody that how do i solo over this dominant chord i was given a scale and i yeah. was told that you can play a sharp 5 in a dominant chord and it's going to sound nice but the emphasis mm-hmm. on the rhythmic aspect so if right. one has to choose uh there's a lot, lot of people they don't get notes right away let's say so if you if you would advise somebody to start practicing ear training how much uh, what is the best place to start at should they keep emphasizing on learning melodies melodies or they should start developing wherever they are at and then wait for the melo- melodic aspect to kind of uncover itself well i mean you know both the elements as in the melodic value and the rhythmic value are both important mm. it's 50/50 mm. that's that's in fact that's how music is defined right melody and rhythm sur and tal so it's really 50/50 the contribution of notes yes i do feel that a lot of emphasis is put on the melodic value on note value and not enough on rhythmic value mm. so these are separate separate studies that need well they come together when you actually play music but they can be um you can become you can train yourself um through studies that focus just on on rhythm and 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 uh, certain certain things that are with your instrument that have to do with with the study of sc- note value you know whether it's chords or or scales and things like that so um i think it's ex- that's something that is extremely important for every musician to be focused on both those studies you know the rhythmic value of the music um because you can sing you can sing melodies without rhythm without the note value and and um for example a melody like um the spain or something like that you know if i would i could either sing it with the melodic value pa pa da da ba da ba pa ru da pa da pa 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 or i could sing that same phrase but without the melodic value and only the rhythmic value so pa pa da da ba ba pa da da pa da pa 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 right that's right. so i focusing just on the rhythm value so these are both the one needs to develop both those aspects of your um, musicality mm. i mean you know these this is like actually you know, know what we're just talking about is like the core if you develop these things it'll just make you a, a better musician period mm. i'm not talking a better bass player better keyboard player or better guitar player it'll just make you a better musician you know and as i said before i've always looked at myself as a musician first you know and a guitar player second you know um and uh, you want to always develop musical qualities not necessarily guitar qualities mm. or bass i mean you want to look at it as a whole right. you know you all will have your primary instrument that you're going to shed on but you need to look at music as a whole especially when you're in the bandstand playing with five other musicians you know you are one your your one unit mm. you know and you need to so those are musical qualities and time and good years to hear melodies that's like the basic foundation so uh, that has to be worked upon and developed all the time right right by learning new information uh you know simple things like practicing with a with a metronome to better your internal clock things like that you know stuff that that gives you a certain kind of discipline Thank you sir. So uh, I hope that answered your it question. It absolutely did and uh, I think on that note uh, I would like to thank you for coming to the School of Bass podcast and it's just been fantastic. Anything you want to suggest, anything you want to add? No, I'm I'm very happy to be part of this uh, podcast. So Rob, thank you uh, for inviting me to be here. Oh, actually I do have something to say. Yes. Which I'm extremely extremely excited about which is some new music 
uh, which is going to be released by Markaba. That's right. Uh, the, which is with um, Vasundra V, uh, who's singing and writing lyrics. Gino Banks is playing drums. Sheldon is Sheldon De Silva is playing bass. Um, uh, also, on this first single that we are releasing, which should be, I think, in the next, perhaps sometime today, we're going to release it. Um, called Good Days. Um, has Louis Banks playing a piano solo. It has Rahul Wadwani also playing uh, electric piano. And it has Tavi also doing some programming and some sound design. And this is a project that I've kind of been at it for, for, for quite a while, you know. Um, and the music is, I'm very excited about the music, the way it's turned out, the way it's sounding. So I, for those of you who are listening, please watch out for it. I'm going to be posting it on, on Facebook um, shortly. Yeah, it's going to be out soon. It's, it's being yeah. edited right Dharab has already heard, Dharab has already heard it. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to the release, sir. All the best. And um, yeah. we'll keep in touch. And uh, I want to document a little more of your uh, gear and how you prep for a gig and everything. And we'll do that later sometime when things normalize a little more. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, that's, that sounds good, man. Perhaps maybe we can do uh, the next one when things settle down in person. That's man. right. That's what I'm going to do after the uh, lockdown. It's not a lock, just, just a lockdown thing. Right, right. Of course. Thank you, sir. I know. I'm going to hang up, All the, right, bye. hang up the call now. Thanks a ton. Very nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Thank you everybody for coming. This was exciting. I'll see you next week at uh, the same time, same day. Bye.